Hello and welcome back to another edition of Inside FSR. This time we're going inside the Japanese Grand Prix. My name is Edward Hunter and I'm joined as always by Burst Esports' Tom Oldenmenger, but also our new 2023 FSR VCO World Champion, a four-time world champion for the first time. It's of course Yerne Simoncic, a man who needs no introduction. So thank you very much for joining us, Yene. I know you were a little ill with COVID recently, but uh, I thought we'd give you a week to recover. And uh, wow, so first off, congratulations uh, on uh, sealing not just uh, the Drivers' Championship for the fourth time, but also uh, for Burst sealing the Teams' Championship for, I believe, the third time. Yeah, uh, thank you. Um, yeah, I'm quite a lot better now after the COVID. It fixed itself to to a good level just enough for uh, for the japanese grand prix so i could do some driving uh, but i'm much better now uh, but yeah really nice result there to be multiple world champion um, in a league that that was top of the top in rf2 or rf1 before that for many years and is maybe now fighting for that position against maybe other competitions, but it's still up there. Uh, most of the big sim racing teams are there, so uh, yeah, it, it's a pretty pretty good title to have. And Yernik, I just want to say, because uh, you, of course, uh, took a sabbatical last year, and now you've come back, as you say, there are the, you've got Ferrari Esports there, you've got Alpine Esports, you've got Brabham as well in there, Varnage, you've got all these pretty, pretty big names, and Burst was able to beat all of them, uh, thanks very much to you, and also, of course, uh, David Mrokchek's uh, help as well in the team's championship, so uh, it really feels like uh, you haven't lost a step since uh, you went away, uh, despite having a big, big challenge from the likes of Jake Denahan, Dennis Jordan, and Colin Spork this year, and uh, you've uh, you've very truly uh, showed that uh, <laughs> you hadn't, like I said, you hadn't lost a step. Now, uh, in the middle of the season, it was apparent that that we need to really step up our game uh, because of Spork and Alpine going full crazy with their preparation and with the pace that they had. It, it was just amazing. Uh, so, it, yeah, we were under big pressure there. Um, but, yeah, in, in the end, it worked out for us. So, yeah. Well, congratulations once again. So, without further ado, Tom... Let's dive in then to the Japanese Grand Prix itself. Dramatic, dramatic start, of course. Jake Denahan on pole from Yerne Simoncic with that last, last minute effort. But for our other title contenders, Dennis Jordan and Colin Sport, not only do they not qualify well, but there's a big, big incident at Degna 1 on the first lap that effectively uh, compromises Dennis Jordan's race and takes Colin Sport out of the running altogether then. Uh, so uh, can you talk us through it? Yeah, I mean, it shows the importance of uh, qualifying, uh, which... To be honest, it's really difficult to do in World Championship looking at how close those gaps are and, you know, being just a couple of tenths off and suddenly you're in the middle of the field and then it's so easy for something like this to happen. So, yeah, as we're heading into Dagna 1, Jordan is on the inside of Matthew Williams and, yeah, so he takes a bit more of the curb, hits the anti-cut and up to a point you can get away with it, but he just gets launched and then there's contact with Williams. He spins around. And then he makes contact with one car. And I mean, for the neutral viewer, that's like the worst car to hit because it's Colin Spork. And if we look on board with him, like, all right, there's all this chaos happening. He makes a decision to go right, but Mika Hakimi is there as well. So he's sort of in the middle. And then Jordan keeps spinning. And then there's, yeah, there's a bonk and he loses his front wing. And then that's basically the race over for him, the championship over. And, um, yeah, I guess he gave it the old college try, but pretty quickly just realizes he it's no use and the championship is over and he, he kind of gives up. Yeah, but he, he didn't have a great start either because he got the penalty coming in from Monza that dropped him from 6th to 10th. So his chances going into Zuka were a little bit remote for Colin, but for Dennis Jordan, arguably, it was the bigger blow because uh, he was only 18 points behind. And uh, coming out of this, he's not only... Uh, back down to third in the championship but he's mathematically out of contention for the overall championship itself so it was a big big blow for both ferrari and alpine uh, uh in both sense of uh, in both championships really wasn't it 
th there's no more on to next race for Dennis because the championship is over basically and uh, surely looking back there's a couple of moments where well against Journey especially the he was in a direct fight and you know ifs and buts had he beaten Yerne here and there then perhaps the championship would have been alive and something that happened here to Spork and, and Dennis uh, could have happened to could, could happen to Yerne next race and then all of a sudden things could have been different but yeah it is what it is so Yerne when you heard that uh, you were obviously told on the by a race engineer at burst uh, what happened behind uh, what was your reaction to that obviously you're focusing on Denahan in front of you but when you realize that's the only person you have to fight uh, for the championship and overtake, does that fill you with confidence or does it make you feel, right, a long way to go, I better settle in? It was the most unthinkable th that I could ever imagine that two of the main contenders were gone in lap one. Uh, I just never expected anything like that. Um, and I don't think I had any special thoughts about it. Um, but as the laps progressed, I realized and also the engineer confirmed that if I just beat Denhan, then I'm the champion. So that was the suddenly the, the only focus of the race. Maybe with Dennis and Colin fighting through, th through the grid, uh, I expected them to still be towards top five in the end of the race uh, at, uh, when the lights went out. That's what I had in my, in my mind. Um, with that, I would have probably approached the whole race differently and maybe accepted P2 and uh, just went safer with the strategy. Uh, but yeah, as the, the race went uh, towards the middle, it made a lot of difference to know that there is just Jake that I'm fighting. Um, so yeah, it, it did change uh, a lot uh, in the race for me. That's interesting because uh, I'm thinking back to the battles with Jake. There are a lot of moments where you backed out of a move because it was clearly going to be really, really risky and you only were able to just about pull it off on the final lap as it happens and we'll get to that. But uh, I, I, that, that wasn't what I was expecting you to say, Yerne. So that is actually quite surprising and insightful there. Uh, but anyway, I suppose the next topic I want to move on to is the race strategy which tom you know you and i love talking about this because we did the whole we've done several episodes where we talked about it uh but uh, i'm thinking about uh of the two stop versus the three stop essentially yerne alex siebel and devin rockjack all three stopped but a lot of the others in the top five top six all opted for the two stop including of course uh jake denahan uh, Petr Briliak, uh, Sander Kallas was another one as well. I think Genas Braxok wanted to do it and then got a drive-through penalty as well. So that was another one that Yene didn't have to pass, of course, for uh, speeding in the pit lane, if I remember correctly, for Janos, which is a bit unlucky. But uh, but yeah, that it, it really did, ended up defining uh, how things played out, uh, especially in those final few laps uh, where Yene uh, had maybe... Uh, uh, oh, he was he was the man on the charge. He had loads and loads of pace, but he had to make those moves really, really quickly, due to having made that extra stop. Yeah, he had to be aggressive and and going into the final chicane, uh, you know, to make those moves. And uh, yeah, if you go for the extra stop, you have to make it work. Uh, so not only do you need to pure pace, but also make the moves when you can. Uh, and this. Uh, as we've seen, fighting Jake uh, wasn't the easiest track to overtake on, so it was risky. And if you look at the final results, it's actually um, well quite spread out. Like there's not a clear better strategy because the doing the extra stop, uh, you know, you could finish P1, P4, P6, um, you know, and the rest doing a stop less. So you know, if you look at the top ten, then it's pretty evenly spread out. So I don't think there was a clear better strategy here today uh, and also if you look at how close the final results were um, so it's more about making work what you have in terms of your strategy and well clearly clearly you only did yeah and the other thing is you can get really held up in traffic as well you saw what happened to ENA's teammate David Rockjet he spent quite a large chunk of the race stuck behind Matthew Williams and that ended up costing him a couple of positions in the end because uh, Matthew Williams just on the older tyres is able to hold him at bay before his his own final pit stop as well. And then towards the end, that scenario repeated itself. So yeah, and they did very, very well not to get caught up in uh, behind either Sander Callas or Pedro Brulliak. And that was what enabled William to have those final three laps where he was absolutely all over the back of, of Jake Denahan. Is that a fair analysis, Yene? Yeah, no. <laughs> 
Mm, no, it, it is it is quite fair analysis. Yes. Um, yeah, there was just um, one chance uh, at at each card that was not Jake for me. I, I needed to get everybody in the first try. Uh, that was crucial part of it. Um, yeah, it was. It turned out to be quite risky the decision to go for a three stopper, but. <laughs> Yeah, I don't know if it was luck. If uh, maybe, maybe the the guys didn't really defend that hard uh, as they could, but they knew that eventually I was surely going to pass them. So why, why uh, lose time defending? So maybe, maybe it was not that lucky, but just uh, the nature of how the strategy unfolded. And also, Sander Callas and Petter Bruet were not fighting you for the championship as well. Although arguably Petter was in the teams, but. Uh... But yeah, so, so I think that's a fair point, yeah, no. Um So Tom, shall we move on to uh, the actual, talking of pit stops, lap 19. Danahan comes in, yeah, no, follows in right behind, as does Yanis Braxock and some of the others. And what happens is Jake gets right on the brakes and uh, slides into his pit box. And yeah, no, gets a little bit of a scare, but luckily has just enough space to avoid uh, running into the back of Jake here. Yeah, so on uh, lap 19, um, I, I think it was more about um, not speeding into the speeding in a pit lane because what you can see is that um, you know he's breaking really hard and then uh, I suppose regen kicks in so the rear steps out and honestly if you look at um, how fast he was going as he was crossing crossing the line like it was at this point so it's like here he drops below 80 kph so Mr. Denahan's a lucky boy isn't he Possibly because of his slide, the detection point inside the car was just behind the line. Maybe it was something like that, but I, I don't understand how you can cross the line uh, like this, going you know above 80 kph and, and not get the penalty. So he was extremely lucky. That was like pixel perfect, I think. And then yeah, he's already in the right direction to make his own pit box, so that's an extra bonus. For yeah, there we go. Absolutely minimizing the time loss there. Full Tokyo. Well, it's not Tokyo Drift. It's Masu Saga Drift, I suppose, isn't it? But, um, but yeah, yeah, no. have you ever thought about uh, trying these sorts of moves? Or do you think with a championship up for grabs, just, just go in normally and just wait break for the pit limit? Uh, funnily enough, I was just behind Jake here, but I didn't even notice that he was doing this uh, correction or like a uh, very risky slide or catch. Um no, but pit entry is an interesting topic because it's so easy to gain half a second there um, or maybe even on the exit, but nobody's ever testing at what point one can release the pit limiter or well, at least I'm not, but maybe I should be doing that. Uh, but yeah, it's, <laughs> it's an interesting part of the race where you can really gain or lose, uh, well, a position. Um, but yeah, I was, uh, I, I've always been just trying to get a nice late, but still very safe breaking point um although yeah i i need to step up my game in that aspect for sure <laughs> so you're saying you'll be even faster oh yes 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 <laughs> <laughs> and interestingly uh the pit lane speed limit did as we talked about janos braxock which is the car that yeah they didn't have to pass but also uh janik bock as well also fell fan of it in the first phase of pit he's won the first to pit and fell fan of it and that meant that he came into the pits right in front of the N8, and I think Jake would probably have been hoping he would have held him up for a bit longer. But yeah, I suppose we've been uh, holding him back uh, long enough, uh, Tom. Shall we talk about those uh, final few laps in the battle with Jake? Oh yeah, so like, end of lap 51. It's pretty crazy for Yane to look on the right outside of here, but perhaps, Yane, you were just trying to get him offline and uh, mess with his exit. Yes, there are two ways to overtake here. One is to already overtake uh, into the last chicane by being on the inside and getting ahead. The other way is to force the defending car to be offline for the exit of the chicane and get a nice run um, on the start-finish straight and then yeah, get overspeed and overtake into turn one. Um, but I knew that I had the grip advantage, so I, I just tried to always take what I could. Um, and yeah, it, it was more difficult than expected. <laughs> yeah, how careful did you have to be with your battery throughout the race, Yanni? Because you saw 
here on lap 52, Denahan absolutely dumps it down the main straight and then runs you about as wide as you can possibly just about get away with as well on the exit of turn one. So he's very, very aware that you're still there on the outside. Yeah, I think the battery management was relatively easy here at Suzuka or Matsusaka. Uh, it was not too difficult to uh, like get back uh, like extra 50% of the charge. Um, not sure why exactly, because there is not really a lot of braking zones, but maybe just those long corners where you can hold the brakes just a little bit, just enough to have some regen going on. And um, yeah, I was just looking at that number. I knew that I need to use a bit to to catch Denehan in time, but also to still have kind of 70% ish available for the last uh, three laps. Uh, I dumped also a lot of uh, battery trying to overtake uh, Kalash and Berliak. Um, but I think I talked with Jake after the race. He said that he had actually roughly the same battery as I. So we both kind of had 70% remaining when the battle started. Yeah, so I was just looking at the, the battle at the final chicane there. It felt to me like you pulled to the left through 130R like really, really suddenly and saw that opportunity on the outside. Was that a sort of just do or die moment there for you, Yane? Or did you think, now I've got him? It's it's difficult to explain. Like, it's it's kind of uh, very oh, unique Just about feeling. stayed on track as well. <laughs> yeah, uh, because it's... I mean, it's the last lap, you are going to attack, you have one corner to do it, and you know that you're going to win championship if you do it. So then, kind of, I, I don't know, the, the, the reasoning process goes a bit differently than normally. Uh, I don't know why exactly I chose the left side, maybe there was a little bit of space on the right as well, uh, but I think Jake just uh, kind of defended the middle, he was on the, uh, so going through 130R, uh, I think he was defending the right and there was just about not enough space. Uh, so so here, yeah, we are going into 130R and uh, some laps before I went around uh, the right side on Berliak and it was very marginal, but it worked with two wheels on the curb. But here I saw there was just enough, yeah, just not enough of gap. So here I needed, uh, if I stopped uh, overtaking and uh, tried to go for inside later, it would it, like just makes no sense. I just needed to go for it. So there was outside and uh, there is no time for switchback. I just needed to carry the, uh, the speed wherever I, I could. So it was natural that I'm going to do it around the outside. Mm, and yeah, it, it, was, it was really strange. So the first thing I hear uh, from my engineer here is some bad words towards Jake for uh, really not ideal defending. <laughs> and I was trying to find him uh, around me. I thought he was uh, cutting the chicane here and he would come from the left and we would kind of have a contact or something. I was scared of that. Uh, but then I realized he's a couple of seconds behind. <laughs> Um, yeah, yeah, trust me, cutting the chicane there is a bad idea. <laughs> no, I was yeah, going to say, yeah. <laughs> I, I saw in the pro race, yes. Yeah, the person yeah, yeah. who can tell you exactly how painful that can be. but uh, And uh, it is really, really difficult when you cut the chicane to make sure you slow down just enough. So in a way, we were lucky that it ended with Jake going around and you just about keeping it on track. So there was no need for any kind of investigation afterwards. But, uh, but wow, that was such a touch and go moment. And of course... Um, you had the luxury of knowing that even if it didn't work out, you could have tried again with still a pretty big lead in uh, Brazil. But I think that's certainly what separates uh, some of the great champions, that when there's an opportunity, even a small one, they absolutely go for it even uh, to try and seal the championship a race early if possible. And you've always done that in all of your championships, Yane, as well. There's not one that's gone down to the final race. Yeah, it's, it's really funny how it turns out... Uh... I think it was 2020 that, yeah, it was at Suzuka as well, and we were fighting with Peter, and then he got the, the wheel disconnection. So I was getting lucky with that, and uh, this year I was getting lucky with Dennis and Colin um, underperforming in qualifying, and then being part of that incident. But uh, somebody who wasn't underperforming qualifying was uh, Jake Denahan, so... Uh, 
how do you feel overall about your battles with Jake uh, this year? Because they've been incredibly fun to watch at Bahrain, Silverstone and Suzuka and a couple other races you've crossed paths with him as well. What do you make of this uh, young Irish guy? Well, for sure, we we met many times on track. Uh, usually, or most of the times, uh, Jake was defending and I was trying to get through. But yeah, at, uh, already at the season opener at Bahrain, uh, he was... Uh, straightforward uh, race contender for the win uh, I, I was very surprised but not not too surprised because in the in the months before was in the Formula E accelerate competition he had shown some really surprising pace uh, so uh, for sure he has the pace uh, he has the brain to, to do it um, to, to win races, to win championships, so he uh, outperformed Colin Spork, <laughs> um, and Colin was uh, or is like the big uh, star upcoming, um, but now Jake is kind of ahead of him in the championship. Like even before Suzuka incidents, he was ahead in the championship, I believe. Uh, so that's that, that is uh, a big question mark for me because then. What can I expect uh, from Jake if he keeps improving like this? And if he really goes full effort into sim racing and into esports, then maybe in two or three years, he will be really, really scary and fast. Oh, certainly, yeah. If you think Denahan is scary now, just wait in the future. But uh, I, I'm sure you two are going to have great, uh, many, many great battles to come. And I'm sure the likes of Colin and Dennis uh, and even Alex and the rest of them are all going to up their game as well and we're going to see more battles in the drivers and teams championship in the future but uh, i think I, I have two final questions uh you know, in regards to unless tom has anything he wants to add in about the championship no uh, apart from well done <laughs> it's always good to get that in there as a team member of burst isn't it <laughs> yeah there might be a burst bias there <laughs> oh, yeah i've got i've got to be the neutral party here so my questions you know, are where does title number four rank among the other three uh because uh, uh so, so which one do you think is the one that you cherish the most looking back uh because obviously 2019 the first one the battle with martin gosby your teammate all season then the move to burst 2020 beating peter brilliak in the final round like you say well the penultimate round with the wheel disconnection for Peta for Peta deciding that one and then 2021 uh where unfortunately it was a malaysia being cancelled but you still were able to beat michi hoya and um uh, Alex Siebel, I think, in the end, by a pretty comfortable margin. And then, of course, 23 with uh, that four-way battle for quite a lot of the season, but it ended up just being a straight fight between you and Denahan here at Suzuka. So which of those um, do you, those title battles do you, do you think you're going to look back on and cherish? You're like, wow, that was a, a really proud a moment I'm really proud of. Every one of them is such a different story, and it was a different point of my life and of my career. <clears throat> um Hmm. Uh, for sure, 2019 and and these years uh, were the more difficult. Um, the best one was 2018, but uh, somehow I didn't win in the end because of um, strange reasons. Uh, I'm going full Felipe Massa there and claim myself as <laughs> five-time world champion. But <laughs> nah, uh, of of those that were le legitimate championships uh, or. Uh, championship victories for me uh, i think now 2019 was uh, very very important because we were again battling the 2018 champions and the first four races i got four victories but it was every time really marginal and it was just about like half a second or one second or like any little thing that could have gone different would have destroyed the race but kind of like uh, that 2019 i think it was chinese race that was really insane as I got uh, into one stopper and everybody else on two stopper and they caught me on the last lap uh, and we crossed the line with like yeah a couple of tens difference and one more lap and I would be P4 instead of P1 and there were four four races like that and after that um, uh, the opposition of uh, D'Alessandro and uh, Berlek and uh, Patel I think kind of gave up on the championship. I took so much of a control over what was happening that they just understood that either they really like put their whole life, everything into it to try to battle me, or they just take the season as a little bit of fun 
and well they they made the sensible decision of having some fun and i i then easily won after that uh, and i think 2021 was also kind of a strange one because i started for a couple of races without any good result it was the first year when i got this upgraded sim rig and uh, simu cube and everything uh, like that and for some reason I was kind of struggling a bit, but uh, I didn't feel like I was slow. I, just the results never came. I did a good quality lap every time, and it was enough for P8 or so. Um, so I needed to battle through a different challenge, uh, just, uh, just kind of to to believe in myself and try to be better next round. And that actually happened in the middle of the season. So I came back in 2021 20, from quite far back and take to control and then quite comfortably won the championship in the end um, I think yeah probably 2020 was uh, the easiest one although that disconnect uh, at Sandford was not a nice one um, so it, it's difficult to say I think I think 2029 would be ranking as the first one but this 2029 year, wow we, we, we're thinking long haul here yeah now. <laughs> 20 20 Ah, 20... Uh, 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 sorry, I had an... Uh, 2019. <laughs> 2019. Uh, had an hour of, of sleep uh, as a wife let me sleep without the baby a little bit, so now my head is destroyed from the sleep, so I'm sorry. Um, uh, yeah, 20, 2019 uh, was, was probably the best, or still is the best in my memory, but this year, with, as I said before, the battle against Charging Spork and Alpine with a huge breakthrough and in the setup uh, at uh, Imola and Spa, they were just uncatchable. And then our realization that yeah, we need to deploy all our whole esports knowledge and everything and strike back at Monza. That was also uh, really a nice feeling and nice experience and nice confirmation that we still have it. Uh, yeah, that we still got it and that we can find uh, fight back against top teams and top drivers. Um, so yeah, it's been it's been nice one this year uh, as well. Yeah, and I was there actually for the Formula e Accelerate finals in uh, London, where you and David and Mitchie were all there, and Cameron, of course, doing commentary as well. And it was great to see all that that burst team unity. It always has come across as like such a closely knit sort of unit, and uh, that everyone get gets on really really well and knows each other's strengths and such so uh, it's great to see uh, everyone supporting one another and uh, you being really the leading light there and uh, and performing it once again for the fourth time and it's great to hear about you you and your young child as well as the glamorous life of a quadruple champion <laughs> not getting a, getting about an hour's sleep before this interview but a uh, final question Yanni, before i let you go is of course i think we all remember bono house getting those five world championships 47 victories i think those were in fsr sort of milestones we thought no one would ever reach and now as we look ahead now to 2024 it's with those five titles of bonos are within touching distance so does it motivate you do you think becoming the most successful driver in fsr history is that something that motivates you yene or do you just want to see how many titles you can get out of this before you call it a day uh, many years from now and sort of let's say 2029 <laughs> Mm. <laughs> mm. I'll start by remembering uh, my starts of uh, esports career, or like when I started racing seriously and joined FSR in 2012, when Bono was just uh, undefeatable. Um, I was looking up at him. I qualified him once at I think it was Monaco, but it was uh, Quali One, and then. Quali 2 was for top 10 and I messed up the club. But still Quali, quali 1, I, I got him and I thought, well, maybe maybe sometime in a couple of years I can I can perform like that in every race and be on, on his level. And Well, I, I think, I mean, the results of a couple of past years prove that we are up there uh, at the top, which is pretty nice. But about the FSR itself, well, 10 years ago it used to be the the top and probably the only RF2 league with prize pool. Um, now the yeah, I I don't want to play FSR down or anything, um, but for sure it 
the kind of lost the status of the top of the top in RF2 with uh, LNVS and with Formula Pro uh, going on. But those leagues did not happen this year, so then FSR was the top. As you could tell by the grid. Yeah, so the only guys that were missing were Team Redline, of course, yeah. Um, and Quanda, let's say. Um, so, yeah, another zero or two need to, need to be added to to the prize pool, and then it will be the top of the top again, for sure. And no, this is the, the racing that I enjoy the most. Um, like a uh, full F1 kind of schedule of or format. And um, yeah, let's see how it goes. Uh, let's see how next year's series um, organization will go, will go also from the official RF2 championships and LNVS and everything like that. It's always a judgment of time investment versus returns. It's, it's my job after all. So... Um, my main priority is to earn as much as I can, uh, even if that means that I don't win the fifth FSR World title. Um, but well, let's see. Let's see how it goes. Uh, I chatted with Cameron once a little bit, and I think it's a good chance that I will have a go next year again. But I will need to decide in the upcoming months. Well, whatever you decide, Yerne, it's always a pleasure to watch you uh, out there on track and uh, doing your thing. And I think uh, I think whether it's next year or the year after, whenever you do it, I think everyone is really looking forward to see you go for that fifth title and to see the amazing fight that everyone puts up trying to stop you. But uh, anyway, I think that's all I've really got to say. Thank you very much to our quadruple champion, Yerne Simonjic. Thank you to Tom Aldermenger for helping me out uh, with the interview. And thank you very much to you, of course, for watching and listening thank you very much for your time and we'll see you next time bye for now